You've just returned from the Siberian Arctic Shelf. What can you tell us about this expedition? Are there any signs that subsea permafrost is destabilizing and leading to increased methane emissions? Uh, yes, we uh, all latest reports actually revealed uh, increased. Uh, I would say increased. I should uh, tell the uh, great air fluxes from the Siberian Arctic Shelf. What I actually mean here that not always. Uh, we can uh, talk about increasing fluxes because to report dynamics uh, in methane fluxes, we need to revisit the same areas in few uh, subsequent years, which we don't uh, do always do because we are still expanding the area of investigation. This means that uh, we are going from the near shore area to the mid shelf and to the outer shelf. And what we learned from this experience that methane flux, fluxes actually vary significantly from area to area. This depends on a few different factors. Uh, and from about some areas, we can uh, say confidently that we observe increased fluxes. We gained much more knowledge about fluxes. And we learned few additional mechanisms that allows releases of methane from the Siberian shelf to be more efficient. For example, like increasing storminess, deep water mixing, and a few other mechanisms that makes uh, um, methane releases more efficient than we saw before. Uh, besides that, we uh, applied few new methods which are allowed us to measure fluxes more accurately because we measured them directly by using methods which never been used before in any area of the world ocean. For example, we uh, used accumulated the um, hydroacoustical data, which is sonar data, and uh, calibrated this data right at sea, right in situ, where we measured the fluxes. So this assessment is more are uh, much more accurate. So the bottom line is that when we report the greater fluxes, there should be two components. One component is that in some areas fluxes indeed increase or they reflect the temporal variability in these fluxes. And the second component is that uh, increased fluxes means or greater fluxes mean that we learn much more about the flux parting about variability, about um, nature of these fluxes. This is important to realize. And in, in the expedition that you returned from a couple of months ago, um, what were the what were the main observations in terms of the fluxes that you were seeing? The latest expedition was, that was the winter expedition, and uh, this expedition was devoted to studying the current state of subsea permafrost. We drilled the subsea permafrost and obtained this sediment course so that we uh, explore and investigate the sediment, uh, sediment course, um, which uh, helps us to understand how this process of permafrost destabilization occurs in nature, and especially important in this very near shore area, which is close to the coast, which was submit, uh, submerged by seawater the latest, the shortest period of time. And this area was long thought that to be the most stable, and we expected to find out the permafrost in which the permafrost table is right on top, Right, right, very close to the uh, sea floor, and we didn't find this. So what we observed actually was uh, partially or completely thawed sediment cores, which is very interesting because um, knowing this very important. This gives us less and less um, reason to think that permafrost is experiencing some kind of intact period after submergence. This means that it takes some long time, like for example, some scientists suggest that it requires thousands of years before the permafrost starts degrading from the, from the top of it. And this is what actually, this is what we did observe, because the sites which we explored are in this during this latest expedition are very near shore, very close to the coast, 
they've been submerged just a couple hundred years ago. This means that they should be absolutely stable. They should be continuous permafrost, very close in this in uh, its current state to the coastal permafrost, to the land permafrost, which is uh, a state of about minus eight uh, degrees Celsius or minus ten. But our sediment course was exhibiting the temperature uh, from slightly above zero to slightly below zero uh, degrees Celsius, which is very close to the thaw point or right in the thaw point. So this is what uh, very important findings. And uh, besides this, we found uh, methane releases from this area, near shore, very near shore area, which is comparable to fluxes uh, absorbed in the outer shell. The outer shell is considered to be the most destabilized because it was submerged so long as it's been submerged for tens of thousands of years, at least 10 years or 15 years. And most of the scientists agree that it should have been destabilized uh, all the way up to total disappearance of permafrost, or at least there should be discontinuous or island line permafrost. And the flux that we measured is a very near shore area in this particular site was comparable to that that we measured and absorbed in the outer shell. This is very important to a uh, very important part of our knowledge. So just to summarize that it's the, mm -hmm. the area that you thought would be most stable in yes. nearer shore so, yes. is when you're when you're taking the the uh, ice cores it's it's not stable at all it's it's completely it's not stable uh but i should notice that it's not stable within that uh depth of permafrost to which we drill, drill this permafrost and we drilled uh all the way deep to about 50 meters we don't know 60 meters we don't know what is below but uh, it should have been stable within this depth because near shore area, as I said, is very close to the coast and time period of duration of inundation is very short. It's not thousands of years, it's just 150 to 100 years. The permafrost, uh, the hydrates is uh, permafrost related in the Arctic. Yeah. And the permafrost, uh, the hydrates could be included um, within the permafrost layer or below the permafrost layer. There's different, two different types of hydrates. Uh, usually the, the, the temperature and pressure conditions creates a uh, um, so-called gas hydrate stability zone, which usually uh, close to the bottom of the permafrost. But my, uh, the top of this area might, might uh, change its position. It depends on the climate cycle. In the cold uh, climate epoch, the uh, top of this hydrate stability zone comes a little uh, higher. And during the warm epoch, a little lower. So this, the, this, this top position of this um, hydrate stability zone that fluctuates, it's subjected to alteration upon the climate cycle. The stability of hydrate deposits is determined by stability of permafrost. Permafrost loses the stability when it gets warmer, gets warmer. And especially when the permafrost uh, reaches the thawing. This literally means that uh, the gas migration pathways builds up within this permafrost. And this is what allows this gas converting from hydrates to free gas to pass through this migration process and release to the water. And because the water is shallow, it releases all the way to the atmosphere. Maybe this would be the shorter. And do you think um, there's the, the issue then of how far the warming goes as to, you know, as to how, how much the process accelerates? Absolutely. The greater the warming, the greater uh, this process, because the, um, the, maybe the most important thing to realize that 
The Arctic is forming twice as fast as the world is the world. But within the Arctic area, the Arctic shell is the most vulnerable area because it started forming well before the modern warming appeared. So it started warming when it was submerged by seawater. So long before the planet started dealing with the, the modern climate change, the East Siberian Arctic Shelf in particular, and Arctic Shelf and the whole, they experienced this natural warming which was determined by change in climate cycles, from the cold climate epoch to the warm epoch. And the East Siberian Arctic Shelf, you should realize that it's been experiencing the warming up to 10 degrees Celsius already before this global warming started, just because it was submerged by seawater and because the temperature of seawater relative to the temperature of the environment in which the permafrost was formed, which was minus 17, minus 20 degrees Celsius, is about 10 degrees difference. This is what made this permafrost to be warm and destabilized well before the modern warming started. The warming, the warming, the global warming, the current ones, the modern one, accelerate this process, which is logical to expect. But is it, when you say that it, it was minus 17 and then you had a warming of 10 degrees, it's still minus 7, which is below freezing. Um, with modern global yes. warming, uh, can you explain how modern global warming is impacting it and what the conditions are that cause the change? Uh, or the destabilization, I should say. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, you're right. So from the minus 17 to minus, uh, the minus 10 is still minus 7. And this is probably what we should expect in uh, some part of submerged permafrost, which was submerged for the longest. This is what keeps some part, of, some fraction of permafrost probably not reaching, not still, not, not still have, uh, have reached this top point. But what we see in our sediment course, which we extracted 14 sediment for so far. We, we didn't observe minus 7 degrees Celsius in any of the bubbles. So the temperature is higher and the warmer. It's, as I said, from slightly minus, uh, slightly below zero to slightly above zero, which is very close or right in the point, right the so point. This is what makes the permafrost to be uh, ice bearing or just thawed sediments. And in some uh, sediment course, we absorb layers of ice bond of permafrost. Usually, it's fresh sediments which is which store at temperature zero degrees Celsius, but it's just layers. So the pattern is much more complicated than this. And we, uh, I think, this knowledge that we accumulated and data we accumulated is enough to say that the global warming contributes to uh, warming of subsea permafrost by the um, warming effect of uh, the seawater, which is also, the seawater also gets in, uh, increased in its temperature, it's warming too, and this is what contributes additionally to that natural warming that occurred starting from a thousand years ago. And you've also, um, you've also highlighted before that you've had increased storms. Uh, how do storms affect um, the deterioration or the destabilization? of the subsea permafrost? Uh, what is storms in its essence? It's uh, deep water mixing. And what deep water mixing does, usually, uh, for example, when the seawater warms due to increasing river runoff, usually the surface water warms and the deep, uh, the bottom water stays intact. But when the deep mixing occurs, the water mixes much better. Not only that the sea, uh, the entire water column increases in its temperature, but it also provides a methane release as a very efficient mechanism because the greater, the, the, the thicker the uh, mix, mixing layers, the more efficient gas exchange between the boundaries like water and atmosphere. So this, this is what we mean when we say that the new uh, climate change related feedbacks are forming in the East Siberian Arctic Shell, which is increasing water temperature, increasing storminess, declining ice cover, 
are all together, all combined, serve to increase efficiency of methane release from the uh, vestibular junction. 